Are you still in your same office, Sheldon? Looks like it. Yep. All right. Yep. They're yep. huh. just knocking everything down around you and your no, spot. Or... No, this building's fine. It's just across the street, they knocked down uh, this this building will be here. I mean, this building is never going away. It's just on the National Historic Register. So. That's good. So, uh, Marcus, don't take this the wrong way, but every time I see you, I think of Fado. Of whom? Fado. Pavel. Fado. Music. Oh, Fado. I see. I see. Yeah, good, good. You, you taught good. me the genre. So, uh, oh, Fado. Very good. Very good. I'm yeah, but it can be taken time. the wrong way. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, it loses something if you have to explain the joke. Yeah, yeah. I see. Well, maybe, maybe if there is time in the in the in the question period, I can sing a little bit. <laughs> oh <laughs> wow! Bit oh, that is some offer. <laughs> no, 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 it's a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, I still, I still like it. I still like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still recording. <laughs> Never bothered me before. Oops! Uh, did I do something wrong? Um, sorry. I don't know, but but it's true. Your your screen has disappeared, at least over here. Uh, strange. Oh, screen sharing is paused. Let me see how I. Let me let me do it again. Let me just start the share screen again. Sure. Uh, back, uh... Oh yeah, I, I I know what I what I yeah, yeah sorry. Andrew, this is wrong. I don't need to do anything, do I? Nope, we're all set. Thank you. Good. Oh, it's okay. Okay, sorry. It's okay, but uh, oh yeah, there it is. There it is. Now I see it. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll wait just one minute and then. Sure, sure. <clears throat> All right, uh, you ready, Marcos? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. All right, so then uh, let's see. Right. Uh, so Welcome again to the WHCGP. We're delighted uh, this week to have Marcos Mourinho from the University of Geneva, who will speak about resurgence and non-perturbative topological strings. And if you have questions, just uh, just speak out uh, anytime. Uh, all right, take it away, Marcos. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, on the other hemisphere, I guess. So I'm going to talk about the resurgence and non-perturbative topological strings. And uh, uh, since this is a colloquium, I'm going to give some sort of general introduction to resurgence, or at least the parts of it that we will need. And then I will see how this can be applied to understand non-perturbative aspects of topological string theory. OK, so let me start with uh, something very elementary, which is that um, in many quantum theories, we actually uh, don't calculate things exactly, but we mostly use perturbation theory to calculate observables as a power series in some sort of variable that we call a, a small coupling constant Z. So formally, what we produce very often are formal power series of this type where Z is going to be my coupling. Later on, it's going to be the string uh, coupling. And uh, we produce formal power series, which are just collections of, of numbers a n with this monomial Z to the n. Now, the bad news about this series is that very typically, they diverge factorially. And this was observed very long ago in a very beautiful paper by Freeman Dyson. So these coefficients a n that we compute in perturbation theory diverge typically like n factorial. So, so this is the generic behavior. It can, there can be exceptions to this, but this is the generic behavior. Now, if you have a series where the coefficients grow factorially, this means that you will have, to the very least, a big problem in extracting, uh, for example, numerical predictions from this series. Because this means that this series, this formal series that I have produced, has zero radius of convergence. So, so there are many problems, but there are even technical problems in just extracting numbers from this series. Now, string theory is actually no exception to this. And it, this was uh, uh, noticed uh, very early. So there was this, uh, for example, this very uh, 
nice paper by David Gross and Vipul Periwal, whose title is actually string perturbation theory diverge. So this is very generic and it, it also affects the string, string theory. Now, this is really a long story if you want to make sense of this type of divergent series, but it has been recognized for a long time that if you have a series that factorial diverge, this is a signal that your series cannot really give you the full information of the theory. Sometimes people say that these factorial divergent series are signaling the presence of non perturbative effects that you have to take into account. And these non perturbative effects are typically exponentially small in this coupling constant Z that we introduced before. Now, this is kind of very hand waving. So, this is sometimes what people tell you when you're a graduate student. And making sense of this side of, of hand waving is actually a highly non trivial thing. And uh, in a sense, what I'm going to try to do here is to explain you a way of making sense of this type of statements in a sort of more or less rigorous mathematical way. And, and the way to give uh, appropriate mathematical form to this idea that factorial divergent series lead to exponentially small corrections, uh, I mean, the best mathematical framework to do this is what is called the theory of resurgence of Jean Ecal. So Jean Ecal is a French mathematician and he introduced this theory partly motivated by the work of physicists studying non perturbative effects in quantum theory. Also, I have to say that Ecal had many other uh, interests, including, for example, studying nonlinear dynamics, and this was uh, another source of his theory. Now, in this, in this talk, what I'm going to do is to try to give a, a little bit of mathematical format to these uh, non perturbative effects by introducing the idea or the concept of a resurgent structure. So what we will see is that if you give me a factorial divergent perturbative series under quite mild conditions, I can define a structure associated to it. And in this structure is where we are going to find these non perturbative effects. And, and this gives you a way of pr a proper mathematical framework to understand this. And then I will show how this idea can be applied to topological string theory. So the first part of my talk will be quite generic. And in fact, these ideas can be applied to your favorite uh, divergent perturbative series, the ones that you can find, for example, in quantum mechanics or in quantum field theory or so on. Okay. Okay. So let me start with this. And let me start with uh, uh, considering a formal power series, like the one that I started with, phi of z. Uh, which is a formal power series in the small coupling constant Z. So Z is a, a complex variable. And AN, I'm going to assume that AN grow like N factorial. Now, when you have a series of this type, this is sometimes called Gevray 1 series. And what we want to do, in a sense, is to abandon this kind of very wild world of factorial divergent series to introduce a kind of milder object where we can use uh, some tools that uh, we are familiar with. And to do that, the way to do that is something which is called Borel transform. And this is a deceptively simple way of transforming this type of series, which where the coefficients grow factorially, into something where we can apply complex analysis. And the way to do this is very naive, as I said. You just take this series and you just produce another series, uh, which I'm going to call phi hat of zeta, in which you just divide a n by n by n factorial. Mm -hmm. And then you introduce another variable zeta. So you have to think about this as a transform, like a Laplace, like a, some sort of Laplace transform or Fourier transform. And actually, you can actually see that this tra Borel transform is actually the inverse of the Laplace transform in, in an appropriate sense. Okay. So, so when you do this, you leave the world of this factorial divergence series and you go to the world or actually analytic functions at the origin. You one can show that the, if the if the series is given a one then this Borel transform is going to be analytic at the end. Okay, so that's very nice because we can use complex analysis. Okay, now, uh, so if you have a function which is analytic at the origin, you can try to analytically continue this function away from its natural uh, domain of convergence. And, and here we are, uh, here there is a, a kind of technical assumption in the theory of Ecal, which is what he calls endlessly analytically continuing, continuing functions. So he assumes that these Borel transforms are going to be analytically continuous along the complex plane without finding, uh, without finding sets of singularities which are very bad. Okay? So the, the idea is essentially that if you find singularities, you can avoid them by deforming a path. Okay? So this is, this is something that you know, one can define more rigorously. But the idea is that the set of singularities that you'll find shouldn't be very, very, very crazy. For example, you shouldn't find 
boundaries of, of uh, form of, of, of then sets of singularity. Okay. When this is uh, when this is the case, you are going to find a nice structure in this plane of the variable zeta, which I'm going to call the Borel plane, and you're going to find all kinds of singularities like poles, branch cuts, and so on. So these are this is an, an a structure which is hidden in the original um, divergent series, and that you can in a sense unravel when you do this Borel transform. Now um, let me give you a very trivial example. So the simplest factorial divergent series is just taking k factorial times z to the k. Now, if you do the Borel transform, you just have to divide by k factorial, and you get a series, you get the geometric series zeta to the k, which you can actually naturally extend to a meromorphic function with a pole at zeta equal to one. So you see that in this case, you know, you can you you get an analytic function at the origin, which can actually be analytically extended to the full complex plane. And the only price you have to pay is a sort of simple polar z equal to. Of course, the real life is much more complicated than this, but this gives you an idea of what we want to do. Now, one of the main ideas in the theory of resurgence is that these singularities of this Borel transform contain non perturbative information, which is hidden in the original divergence series. So our goal is like Alice in Wonderland to try to explore these singularities and to see what is the information which is uh, contained there. Okay. Now, to extract this information, what we're going to do is to zoom this Borel transform analytically continued near uh, its singularity. And we, what we're going to see is that this leads naturally to new formal power series. And for simplicity in this talk, I'm going to consider a sort of simple situation in which the singularities are just logarithmic branch cuts. Now, the, the formal power series which leads uh, whose Borel transform lead to just logarithmic branch cuts are called in, in a Carl's theory, simple resurgent functions. You can, of course, extend these to more general classes of functions, but for the purposes of this talk, this is going to be enough. Now, if you have a, a logarithmic singularity, say at zeta equal to zeta omega, you can expand your uh, analytic continuation around this point. And then what you're going to find is a log uh, around the singularity of zeta minus zeta omega. Remember that zeta omega is the location of the singularity. And then you're going to have a formal power series uh, in, the, in, in the variable zeta minus zeta omega, which I'm going to call phi hat omega, okay? So this is a formal power series that, uh, uh, which is actually analytic uh, in this variable, which you find by zooming around the singularity and which multiplies the part of the series which, is, uh, which contains the singularity. Then there are going to be regular terms but we want to focus on the part which is attached to the singularity. Now, as I say, this uh, phi uh, hat omega is analytically at the origin. So in this variable psi, which is the difference, so it's, it's the local variable around the singularity, is going to be analytic. But uh, actually, we can think about it also as the Borel transform of another factorial divergent power series, which is associated to the singularity. So, this can seem strange because you know we are getting a, a, a convergent series and I want to transform it into a new factorial divergent power series, but this has a, a natural interpretation in the theory. So and I, I, I might come back to this, but for the moment being, believe me that this is a natural transformation. So I'm going to create now a new series in the variable Z, which is going to be, I'm going to call this phi omega, which is going to be obtained by this local expansion around the singularity, and then I'm going to multiply these coefficients by n factorial. So these coefficients a hat omega, a, a, a hat n omega grow exponentially because this is a, a convergent series. But once I multiply by n factorial, they become, they become Gevre one functions. And then I have just obtained from the singularity of the Borel transform of a factorial divergent series, a new factorial divergence series, okay? So this is the kind of this Alice in Wonderland principle that you start looking at the singularities and you start finding more and more factorial divergence series. Now, when I introduce this, uh, this, this thing, uh, sorry, when I introduce this thing, I introduce also a number here, S omega. So S omega is sometimes called a Stokes constant and its value depends on a choice of normalization of this series, okay? So, so depending on how you normalize this series, 
this is those constant will be normalizing one way or another. Yeah, I, I just introduce it because very often these series have natural normalizations and then these numbers are well defined and have actually a meaning. I will come back to this later on. So, so this, this structure that I have uh, described, which is in a sense quite uh, uh, elementary, is, in a, is the beginning of this resurging structure. Now notice that from the each singularity of this Borel transform, I obtain a new formal power series by this procedure I just described. And now you can just take any of these divergent power series and you can repeat this procedure and obtain yet more divergent series and you can get more and more, okay? And at some point, you know, maybe after an infinite number of steps, you should get a, a, a finite collection, uh, sorry, an infinite collection mm, uh, in which uh, you have collected all possible information that you can get in this way from all possible singularities of all possible Borel transforms of all these cities. And this is what I'm going to call the resurgent structure associated to my formal power series phi z, okay? But, you know, now is a moment to pause and just you know and and, and just uh, uh, consider what we have. What we have is we started from a, a factorial divergent power series, and through this trick of the Borel transform, we have found a possibly infinite family of new formal power series phi omega associated to the singularities of phi of the Borel transform of phi z. Okay, and then you can keep going and extract more and more. Uh, series from the singularities of the series that you're taking this way and so on, okay? So this is a very rich structure and it's not very easy to compute, to put in mind, okay? And, um, and this structure, is the, is the, this resulting structure is in a sense the mathematical formulation of the non-perturbative sectors associated to the perturbative series that we started with, okay? Now, let me... Uh, so, so you see that this is a very rich structure. Huh? So, you know, we get a, a, an incredible amount of information just by, by going through the singularities of this Borel transform. Uh, now, in actual calculations, what you actually have to do is to multiply these uh, formal power series associated to the singularities by an exponential of minus the location of the singularity divided by z, okay? And this is just because when you actually, wait, uh, when you actually, for example, discontinuities of what are called Borel resumations, these objects are, are natural. So remember that I did, uh, I'm now doing two things that look a little bit strange. First thing is that I multiply, I multiply these ANs by factorial to produce factorial divergent series. And now I'm multiplying by this exponential, but uh, believe me, these are natural things to do. So notice in particular that the location of the singularity gives me the strength of this exponentially small correction, okay? So, and, and this object, which is a formal power series in Z, factorial divergent times a, a, an exponential of minus complex number divided by Z, this object is sometimes called a trans series. And it's called a trans series because it includes a new small parameter beyond the parameter z that we introduced at the very beginning. So z, remember, was a natural small parameter because we were considering series in powers of z. And now we have a new small parameter, which is this exponential. I'm calling this small because if z is a small and, and zeta omega has a positive real part, this is going to be an exponentially small quantity, okay? So you, you, you typically think about this as new small parameters to include in your series. And, and these sort of trans series have many applications in, in, in many different fields. They appear, for example, when you try to construct solutions to ordinary differential equations around irregular singular points. They appear when you do saddle point analysis on multidimensional integrals and so on. So, so these trans series are, are natural objects to consider. And as you can see, I can also obtain them by looking at these singularities of my original power series or, or its Borel transform. Okay? So this is, uh, this is how I'm going to collect uh, this information about these uh, singularities and, and about this formal power series by adding this exponentially small quantity in front of it. Uh, now, in physics, these objects are quite natural. And, and these are actually the kind of objects that you obtain when you do non perturbative calculations in physics. So for example, if you do instanton corrections in path integrals, 
these are natural objects to, uh, that appear. So this exponential here, the coefficient that multiplies one over z is actually typically in instanton calculations, the instanton action is the action of the instanton that you are considering in the path integral. And this series phi omega of z represents the quantum fluctuations around the instanton. It's in a sense is the perturbation series around a non-trivial subtle point in your path integral. So, so these are um, these are objects that appear naturally in physics, in particular in instanton physics. And here I have uh, described them by using a more formal approach. And what is very crucial in my approach is that these objects were obtained by looking at perturbation theory only. I just am not I'm not doing anything fancy in terms of uh, doing a saddle point expansion or finding saddle points of an integral. I'm just considering my original perturbative series and extracting this information from the singularities of its Borel transform. So, so let me give you an application of of these of these uh, of these uh, objects, which are going to play a role later on. Now. If you remember that all these new formal power series, phi omega, appear by analyzing the singularities of this Borel transform. Now, if these singularities are not very wild and they don't, uh, and they don't, uh, for example, they don't, uh, they don't form then sets near the origin, there will be one singularity of the Borel transform which will be the closest one to the origin. Okay, this means that psi omega associated to these singularities will be in a sense the smallest one. So this is the singularity that gives you, in a sense, the largest, the largest correction to your theory. Okay. And let me call this uh, singularity, uh, the location of this singularity, capital A. So the trans series associated to this capital A is going to be of this form. You will have an exponential here, and then you will have a formal power series. And I, I, actually, here I, I changed my notation from Z to GS. Sorry. So this is to anticipate what is going to come later on. So now, sorry, GS is my, my small uh, variable in, for my expansions. And I have here uh, an expansion, a formal power series. Uh, and then one of the most important results of resurgence is that this trans series determines the asymptotic behavior of the original power series I started with. And actually, if you take the original coefficients AN of my original formal power series, they are going to uh, behave uh, like n factorial. So the uh, asymptotics is going to include a gamma n. And then all the data appearing in the trans series will appear as data of the all orders asymptotics. For example, the location of the singularity is going to appear as a sub leading exponential uh, correction to the factorial growth. And the coefficients of the series are going to appear as the coefficients in a series in one over n. So this is an asymptotic series in one over n, which determines the asymptotics of this coefficient when n is very large. And this is actually where the name resurgence comes from. This means that the trans series that uh, I computed associated to the closest Borel singularity to the origin reappears in the perturbative series by controlling its large order behavior. And this is actually a, a, very, uh, a very powerful idea because it means that the world of perturbative series and the world of non-perturbative corrections are not these joint worlds. Actually, you can read from the behavior of perturbative series are large orders, you can read non-perturbative corrections. So you can, you can use this relationship in two ways. You can use knowledge of this trans series to know the asymptotics and vice versa. You can use knowledge of the asymptotics to know the trans series. Okay? And actually, uh, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but this is just an application of, 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 of the residue theorem applied to the Borel transform. So it's, it's a relatively elementary uh, derivation with some in which you only have to do some sort of um, some sort of uh, uh, bounds in order to uh, guarantee this result. And, and this result uh, actually in physics was discovered in, in a paper that I like very much, which is a paper by Carl Bender and, and Titi Boom. Uh, it's a paper written in 1971 in which they actually ask themselves what is the behavior of, 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 of the perturbative series that appear in quantum mechanics. And what they discover is that the behavior of the perturbative series appearing in quantum mechanics is related to non-perturbative effects that can be computed, say, with the WKB method. Okay? 
So, so this uh, this connection or this, this connection between perturbative and non-perturbative uh, uh, sectors, which was implicit in the work of Dyson, was made more uh, explicit in this uh, paper by Bender and Bull. And as I say, this this connection is very useful because it allows you to make sure that what you are computing is actually correct. So if you have, if you tell me that you have computed this type of trans series, your calculation can be tested against the asymptotic behavior of the coefficients. Okay, and and we will use this later on. Okay, so this is kind of my like twenty minutes summary of resurgence, and uh, yeah, I hope it's more or less clear. But what is is really important is that you can actually obtain new information, which is essentially non perturbative by looking at these singularities of the world transform, or essentially also equivalently, you can extract this information from the asymptotics of your perturbative series. Both statements are quite uh, are closely related. So I, I don't know if there are questions at this point. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So, um, so if I look at a matrix model, mm -hmm. and um, and and then I can get a one over n expansion, mm -hmm. then there might be different non perturbative completions of the matrix model. Mm -hmm. So, I I mean those different. So I could actually give a definition to the matrix model by with the same perturbative series in one over yes. n by you know modifying the potential a little bit or changing the contour. And um, are you saying that those would all lead to the same trans series? Yeah. Uh, one thing that you that you can actually show in many cases is that these different completions might be obtained by by using the same ingredients in the trans series by using different coefficients, different parameters for, uh, for, the, for these exponentially small corrections. So for example, this you can actually do, uh, you are probably very familiar with this, you, know, you, you take the double scaling limit of a matrix model and then you know, this is going to become a nonlinear ODE, right? like for example, pan level one. And then you can actually see that different non perturbative completions of the perturbative series of pan level one are related to adding this trans series to your perturbative series with, uh, uh, say, a two parameter family of coefficients or a one parameter family of coefficients. So the coefficients of these exponential small corrections are going to depend on parameters uh, in the case of, of ODEs or matrix models in a simple way. And by tuning these parameters, you can actually obtain different non perturbative completions of your theory. But I have to say that in order to do this, you have to do Borel resumation, which is a topic that I didn't really get into. Here I'm and doing, if you want, the more structural part, given the perturbative series, how you would obtain from it a natural set of exponential small corrections by just using perturbation theory. But 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 I mean, if I take that matrix model, I mean, I know that I, I have I have a certain perturbative series diverging, mm -hmm. and I know that the matrix model has many different non-perturbative completions with the same perturbative yeah. expansion. So. Um, but you seem to be saying that there's a a natural non-perturbative completion. No, I mean, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying no, that. I mean, am I if I change the def, non-perturbative definition of the matrix model yes. by multiply by changing the potential in some way outside the region around at which I'm expanding, or by changing the the contour? Am I changing the C's in your notation? Uh, your changing you had an expansion for the A's in terms so, of the... so so here you have a family of objects right you have all these phi you have all these phi omega so yeah. you should act you should you, you can find a family of non perturbative completions by adding to your perturbative series this phi omega with appropriate coefficients you know the coefficients in principle you can add a, a new a different coefficient for each omega right the, but you know you sometimes you can actually you know reduce the number of parameters that 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 appear um, uh, a, a little bit. For example, if your omegas are just n, so for example, all these psi omegas are just integers times an action, then you the, the coefficient that appears is typically a power of you know c to the n. Okay. So this is the typical situation when you have, for example, all these. And then uh, for example, you have a, a nonlinear ODE, you will have one parameter multiplying this trans series. And then, you know, this trans series will give you a one parameter family of deformations or non, of non perturbative deformations with the same perturbative limit. Okay. 
But you know, essentially what you have to do is just multiply these trans series by coefficients, and these coefficients will, are going to parameterize um, a non-perturbative completion of the theory. And in many cases, for example, when, you, when your theory is obtained by deforming contours, these coefficients are going to be related to the deformations of the contours. Okay. But, but, but this is a part of the story that I don't really want to emphasize here. I want, what I want to emphasize is how you get the, these building blocks. Then how you combine these building blocks in order to get some non perturbative completion is a different problem in a sense. It's like in a, 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 in a sense, a more difficult problem. Okay, so, so let, let's, let's actually apply this formalism to topological string theory. So, so let, let uh, my, my setting here is that X is going to be a Calabial threefold and uh, for each genus of, of, the, of, of the Riemann surface, I'm going to be able to compute the topological stream free energy FG of T. So for giving a Calabial and giving a genus, there is a procedure which defines this topological stream free energy at genus G. Okay? And this is going to depend on uh, T, which is the Keller moduli of the Calabial. So sometimes I'm going to use like notation for one modulus instead of multimoduli notation for simplicity. But uh, everything I'm going to say in principle generalizes to multimoduli Calabial. Now we know that these FG of T's are functions that a large T have an expansion which encode Grom of Witten invariance of X. So these FG of T's can be expanded a large T and the coefficients of this, so you will have typically exponentials of minus D of T and the coefficients appearing here are the Gromo witten invariance at genus G and degree D of the Calabilla. Now this series has actually a finite radius of convergence. So this is not really the series that I'm going to be interested in because this series is convergent. And you know, we know this, for example, from mirror symmetry. And let me also mention that in, in, this, in this talk, I will use mirror symmetry throughout. Uh, so so I, will, you know, I will use the A model and the B model uh, inter, inter, interchangeably. So I, I actually formulated all these things in terms of the A model, but you can also do it in the B model. In the B model. And in particular, in the mirror manifold, one calculate periods by integrating the holomorphic three form of the mirror Calabillao over a symplectic basis of three cycles. So there are, you know, you have a symplectic basis alpha i and beta i, you have the periods xi and fi, and you can use the xi as projective coordinates of the Calabillao moduli space. Now the mirror map is obtained by, by, by picking one of these coordinates x0, which is different from zero, and then by taking quotients, you calculate the flat coordinates of your Calabillao. So these t's are the ones that appear in, the previous, in my previous transparency. Here, so these are T's that in mirror symmetry you calculate in this way. Okay. Now, if you want to do a stream perturbation theory, you have to add all these free energies mm, to obtain the total free energy. Mm. So you have to do a genus expansion, and then you will have to use a small parameter for this genus expansion, which is the string coupling constant GS. So the total free energy is the sum, is a formal sum of all these functions of g of t times ds to the 2 g t minus 2. Okay? And this is the series that is going to diverge. This is the series that for fixed t is going to give you a, numerical, a numerically divergent series. And there are many general arguments in string theory. This is the, in particular, the argument by Gross and Perry, what I mentioned before, and this was refined by Schenker, indicate that this series grows doubly factorially at fixed t. Okay? So you fix a t inside the common radius of convergence of all these fg of t's, these FG, fg's of t's when g is large are going to grow like 2g factorial. Okay? So that's, that's a fact of life. And that's part of the general divergence of stream perturbation theory and gross and very well were mentioned. Okay? Now, what we would like to do is to see how this factor divergence leads to the appearance of, of non perturbative sectors, and in particular, how these non perturbative sectors can actually uh, tell you something about the non perturbative structure of topological string theory. And in particular, we should be able to refine these asymptotics. Remember that if you know these instanton corrections, you know the asymptotics very precisely. Okay? So one question you can ask is, what is the precise asymptotics of these FG of T's? And this is a test of your non perturbative construction. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to explain you this in a moment. 
Okay. So, so the first question, so I, I just explained you a general story that if you, you, I give you a factor of divergence series, you can actually try to do a Borel transform and look for all these singularities and try to start series on these singularities and, and to calculate what I call this resolving structure. So this is a well-posed problem. And you can actually ask this problem for this uh, series appearing in topological string theory. What is the resolving structure associated to this series? And this is a very difficult problem, okay? And, and let me actually note that in this case, this series is not even a numerical series. The coefficients appearing in the series depends on the modulus t. So everything that I calculate, this structure of the singularities, the new series and so on, are going to be all functions of the modulus. Okay? And so this is what sometimes people in resurgence call um, uh, parametric resurgence because things depend on a parameter and introduces a twist uh, in, in the story. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you partial answers to some of the to the problem of the resulting structure. I'm going to give you a conjecture on the possible location of other singularities, and I'm going to give you an exact description of the trans series associated to the singularities. Okay. So this is quite a bit of information. It's not the, the full information, but it's already um, a, 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 a highly non-trivial non part of, of the resulting structure, okay? Okay, so, so if, if I, as I told you, if, if you consider this formal power series, you can do this Borel transform and try to see where are the singularities? Where are the singularities of this Borel transform? Do they have a meaning? Now, the first conjecture is that Borel singularities for this series of free energies have to be integral periods of the Calabria. Not any complex combination of periods, but actually integral. I'm not saying that every integral period leads to a singularity. I'm saying that every singularity is going to be an integral period. Now, determining which periods are actually singularities is, in a sense, much harder. And I think it's still an open problem, and only partial information is available, okay? And often based on numerical calculations. So, for example, if you actually give me enough terms in this series and a fixed value of, for a fixed value of, of this scalar parameter, I can actually determine numerically sometimes the position of singularity. This is a plot which shows you the Borel singularities in the Borel plane for the FDs of a Calabi-Yau called local T2 for some value of, of the scalar parameter. And you see these points here are Borel singularities and the lines that emerge from these singularities are actually representing branch cuts. So you can actually determine sometimes numerically uh, the location of some of these singularities, typically the ones which are closer to the origin. Okay. Of course, so like Marcos, are these periods of the of the mirror Calabia? Yes, these are mirrors on the Calabia. On the and how do you normalize the, uh, the holomorphic form whose period you're taking? Uh, well, I'm using the Frobenius. So if there is a there is a standard integral basis, which is you take this Frobenius basis at uh, you know. Uh, the Frobenius basis obtained, you know, by by the Picard Fuchs equation, and then you have um, you have omega zero, which goes like one plus z, okay, plus uh, something proportional to z. This is omega zero, and then there is a kind of natural normalization, which was found by by Candelas and company for the Quintic, and that you can generalize for for any Calabi-Yau. So this is a this is a normalization in which uh, I think you have to take, uh, for example, integral periods are are uh, at omega zero, which is goes like one plus something like z, and then there is one which goes like log of z over two pi i, and so on. So, so these are the kind of a standard integral periods of 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 obtain obtain in this way. I think answering to your question, I think the normalization is such that omega zero goes like one plus z. I don't know if this is um, yeah. I mean, this definitely tells you exactly what are going to be these singularities. So you're assuming that there's maximally unipotent monodromy. Yes, yes. Is. This is so the integral periods can be then analytically continued anywhere, right? But they mm -hmm. are defined typically near the point of maximal unipotent monodromy. Okay. So this is this is a conjecture for the possible location of the period. Okay. And now the question is what is the what is the formal power series that you can associate to all these singularities? So what how do you determine this trans series? Now there is a a very nice story in the general theory of resurgence uh, when you apply it to uh, ordinary differential equations. Okay? And 
And, and this is actually related to the question of Greg a uh, uh, few, few minutes ago. So the idea is, is the following. Imagine that I give you a, 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 an OD, like for example, the Euler equation, x squared y prime minus y equal to minus x. So you can actually solve this equation around x equals zero in perturbation theory by assuming that you have a power series in x. And then if you do this, you are going to get a formal power series, which has an n factor. Okay, so this is the in a sense the formal perturbative solution that mimics what we do in quantum theory and in topological string theory. We get something that grows factorial. Now, one thing that you can try to do in order to get the trans series is to use what is called a trans series ansatz for your solution. So you take an ansatz in which y of x is the perturbative solution, and then you add an exponentially small part with a generic coefficient. Okay, and then you can see that in this case, this type of <clears throat> this type of solution, this type of of ansatz, when you have the perturbative piece plus an exponentially small correction, solves the Euler equation. And actually, C is going to remember. Notice that this is a first order differential equation, so it has to come with a boundary condition. And actually, this coefficient C is the boundary condition, fixes the boundary condition for this differential equation. So I'm coming back to the to the question of Greg different values of z here will be invisible in perturbation theory and they will give you different non-perturbative completions of your perturbative theory so this is the, this is what i was meaning before you have to tell me what are your basic trans series and then you have to multiply them by coefficients and this kind of formal sum will be a non-perturbative formal non-perturbative completion of your theory okay that's that's how resurgence would was actually try to construct non-perturbative completions but here, um, so let me see if I understand what you're saying. So, um, in this case, the phi sub omega would be equal just to one. It would be a trivial yes. series. Yes, okay. yes. Here, yeah. the the transitions get truncated to one. Yes. So here is totally trivial. Just you, you only have the exponential part, and then you have this coefficient, which is a parameter, giving you a non-perturbative deform uh, completion in a sense. Okay. But what is what is interesting is that if you have an ODE. You have a, a, a big chance to actually calculate your trans series by just using a trans series answer. Okay. So instead of doing this, this calculation of the singularities from first principles, you try to use the OD to extract non perturbative information in this way. Okay. Now, in the case of topological string, of the political string, we don't have an OD involving the string coupling constant, right? We have something like this for non, non critical strings. You have, for example, you know, uh, 2D gravity. We know that there is a, a, an ODE, which is in this case is actually panel level one, which actually describes the old genus expansion. So you can actually do exactly this kind of thing to compute non perturbative corrections in non critical string theory. But we don't have an ODE involving the string coupling constant in topological string theory and Calabria. What we have is a partial differential equation governing the total free energy. And this is the famous holomorphic anomaly equations over Sasuke, Chekoti, Oguri, and Bach. Okay. So, so this is a long story. And, and, and let me just give you a flavor of how this holomorphic anomaly equation goes. So in the, in the approach of the holomorphic anomaly equation, you write everything in terms of propagators and the moduli of the mirror Caravilla. So propagators are just objects that are non-holomorphic, but they have a holomorphic limit which help you to, uh, so you have, you, have, you have to consider a non-holomorphic version of the theory. And then the dependence of the total free energy on this non-holomorphic um, propagator is actually described by a differential equation, by a differential equation of this type. So you have, the, uh, you have this equation, which is a derivative of the total free energy with respect to the propagator is obtained by taking covariant derivatives of the total free energy, okay? So this is, uh, a kind of uh, simplified version of the holomorphic anomaly equation in the case in which you have a complex modulus and your Calabi-Yau is toric. Okay, the general holomorphic anomaly equation is slightly more complicated, but but you see that it's just a PDE. It doesn't involve the string coupling constant. It's just a PDE relating the dependence on S to the relate to the dependence on Z. Now these holomorphic anomaly equations have been extremely useful to actually uh, define, uh, the construct. Uh, uh, calculate, for example, the FDs. Mm -hmm. So you can actually solve this equation order by order in perturbation theory. And when you do that, 
you obtain the three energies of the topological stream as polynomials in this propagator involving known functions of the modulus z. And this has been studied by many, many people and just citing some of the papers here. So for example, you compute the genus two, three energy using this technique, you will find a polynomial in the propagator, which is a cube divided by 24. And its coefficient is going to be given by what is called the Yukawa coupling or the derivative of F0 with respect to Z, okay? Remember that uh, Z here is, is a modulus of the Calabi-Yau and all my, all my, uh, all my functions depend on that. Now, uh, as I said, in, in when you write these holomorphic anomaly equations, you, you introduce this propagator, which is in principle non-holomorphic, but it has a non-holomorphic limit. And in the holomorphic limit, S becomes a known function of Z. So from the point of view of mirror symmetry, you will eventually obtain a function of Z that then you can go to the A model by using the mirror map and you can write it in terms of T. And this is how many, many of the of the free energies of topological string theory can be computed in perturbation theory. You can actually go uh, to high order in the genus by doing this, and it's one of the most efficient way, ways of calculating in perturbation theory again this uh, uh, expansion of of the of the total free energy in topological string theory. Sorry, Marcos, I'm getting yes. lost. Just to have F G of T, which was defined in terms of gromov witten invariance. Yes. What is that? How is that related to F G of S Z? Well, what you have to do is you have to take the propagator in an appropriate frame, in the electric magnetic frame, which corresponds to large radius, in this case, to an expansion near large radius. And then S is going to have a holomorphic limit, which is a, a known function of Z. And then by plugging this, non -holom this holomorphic limit here, S is going to be a function of Z. And then you span around the appropriate point in modular space, in, in this case will be Z equals zero. And this will actually give you an expansion e to the minus T, which is the gromov witten expansion. So you have to you have to choose a frame. In this case, it's the large radius frame appropriated to a gromov witten calculation. And then you have to calculate the gromov with sorry, the holomorphic limit of S, which is known as a function of Z. So you get everything in terms of Z, and then you go from Z to T using the mirror map. Is that clear? Okay, now I see what you're doing. And so S is a function a priori of Z and Z bar? Yes. But you have to take the holomorphic limit, right? Which is the limit where Z bar is con continued to zero. Yeah, so that go goes to infinity with Z fixed. So S is an, a real analytic function of Z and Z bar, and you can take the limit as Z yes, bar. Yes, absolutely. And then you get just the holomorphic part. And there are kind of a standard formula for the holomorphic limit of S in terms of a special geometry. So this is actually quite efficient to do these calculations. But, um, but what is interesting is that if from this point of view, F is actually a polynomial in S, okay? So, so you can compute this recursively up to a fun functions which are holomorphic, right? So this is the famous holomorphic ambiguity. It's like and an infinite series in S. It's, you're saying it's only a polynomial in S? So yeah, as a function of S is a polynomial, absolutely. Okay. The degree grows with the genus, but it's just a polynomial. Okay, so so what 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 can you do in order to to get this non holomorphic this is non exponentially small corrections these non perturbative corrections? So so inspired by these ideas of resurgence of Ecal, there was a very beautiful couple of papers by by Koso, Ederstein, Schiap, and Vonk, where they propose exactly to do this to solve the holomorphic anomaly equations using a transcendent ansatz as in Ecal's theory of ordinary differential equations. So. The idea is that F will have a perturbative piece. Remember what we did in this. Uh, remember what we did in this um, in this Euler equation. But the Euler equation, we have a perturbative ansatz which determines the coefficients to be n factorial, and then you have a trans series ansatz which fixes an additional piece which is exponentially small. So the idea of these people was to use exactly this 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 framework, this ansatz in the holomorphic anomaly equation. So so. The idea is then you will have a perturbative piece in which you have the FGs, which are functions of S and Z. And then you will have an exponentially small part. Remember that A is going to be an integral period because our conjecture says that you know, the actions have to be integral periods. And this has been known for some time. 
uh, that there are periods. Uh, the integrality is, is I, I think, was not clear until more recently, but that the, the A is a period was, was clear for a long time. And then you will have a power series in GS with additional things that you, could, you should interpret as an instant on correction, or some sort of instant on correction to the perturbative part you have done. Now, if you plug these ansatz into the holomorphic anomal equations, surprisingly, you can solve for these functions Fn1. And in these papers, they actually did some concrete calculations in, in, in one moduli Tori Calabillaus. And for low orders, you can obtain some, uh, some, some terms in this, uh, in this expansion. But the, the results they obtained were not uh, very clear because they were expressed in terms of the propagator. And actually, more recently, we actually try to generalize this work and, and give, a, a, in a sense, give an, an exact solution to this transcendence answer for the holomorphic anomaly equations. And what we found is a very beautiful universal form for the transcendence appearing in topological string theory. So the, the answer is very simple. I'm going to describe it here. And this is actually an answer that uh, describes both the compact and non-compact cases totally generally. So as I said, the action is going to be a linear combination uh, of periods, an integral linear combination of periods. So you can always write it in this way. And let's uh, let's actually uh, assume let's actually define f zero by this equation. So a defines the prepotential in this way. Then the trans series associated to a is given by this closed formula here. So this is an all order solution for the instanton amplitude associated to this Borel singularity. It's the full transcendence associated to that Borel singularity. And it has a very interesting uh, aspect. You see here, what you see is that it has an exponential of the total free energy, the perturbative total free energy, evaluated at the moduli uh, with a subtraction proportional to the string coupling constant involving these numbers here. And then you have a prefactor involving a derivative of f with respect to x also evaluated at this subtractive, um, at this moduli with this subtraction. Okay, so this you can actually prove is is, is non-trivial to prove that this is a solution, an exact solution to the in a sense linearized holomorphic anomaly equation, and it's a universal formula for the one instant on amplitude. So this tells you exactly what is the transcendence associated to. Uh, to the uh, uh, to, to, to the singularity given by a. Now, what is very remarkable is that although this is a non-perturbative answer, it involves only perturbative information. You see, you have to know all the FGs. If you know all the FGs, you can actually write this to any order that you want. So you know the FGs up to genus 50, you can write this uh, expansion up to genus 50. And also, this is the one instant on solution. You can also calculate multi instant on solution. Now, uh, there are various aspects of this formula which are worth mentioning. And, 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 and the first thing that I would like to mention is that this formula suggests that the periods are quantized in units of the string coupling constant. Why? Because, in a sense, what, the, what you are doing here is you are considering the free energy evaluated in a background where the periods, where the moduli of the Calabi-Yau have been subtracted, uh, have, been, uh, have been shifted by integer number of units times string coupling constant. Okay? So this is like a background in, like, in, in which the periods have decreased in an integer number of units times the string coupling constant. This is exactly what you would expect if these, if these periods were actually quantized. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, actual, this, this, pref, this exponential here is actually very typical of something very different, which is what happens in eigenvalue tunneling in matrix models. In eigenvalue tunneling, you have a background where you have n eigenvalues, and then you look for another background in which you switch some of these eigenvalues to another critical point. And this is exactly what we are doing in this formula here. What we're doing in this formula here, we are shifting, we are taking, if you think about, if you think that X is, is, is quantized in terms of GS, we are taking a small number, uh, in this case, uh, CI, a small number of GS string units, you are subtracting this from this background given by XI. And what, what, what was very, very surprising for us is that this is also the case for compact Calabi-Yau. 
This formula is also true for compact Calabiyao. So in non-compact Calabiyao, the fact that the moduli are quantized is some sort of, you know, something that people are used to kind of speculate or used in, in, in the context of large and dualities. But we were surprised that this also happens in compact Calabiyao. So this formula, as I said, is also true in compact Calabiyao. And what I want to do now is to actually give you an empirical test, experimental Our evidence that this formula is true. Yes? Uh, the, the xi the xi is are continuous functions of the yes. complex. Yes. So what do you mean that they're quantized? Well, are you, you have, how, why, what is the condition that's quantizing the moduli? Well, we are not. I'm not saying that this is is, is saying that the, the moduli are quantized, but this is the if if a quantity only can only, you know this is a different background. You are thinking about you have your perturbative background and then you are moving to a non perturbative background. And this one perturbative background seems to have been obtained from the perturbative background by subtracting from this continuous xi an integer number of powers of the of, 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 of the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see that from your formula. Yes. I just but, but this is exactly what would happen in a matrix model. In a matrix model, in, in, when you do the Toft expansion, you would see the Toft parameters as continuous quantities. It's when you do an instanton calculation that you will see that these Toft parameters. When you go to when you do eigenvalue tunneling, you have to go to a background in which you have to when you you do exactly this type of subtraction. That's that's why I'm saying that this formula suggests. I'm not saying that it proves. Suggests that the xi are in a sense quantized in units of your string. This um, is exactly the one that you would find in a in a, in a eigenvalue tunneling. Exactly. Um, I have a quick question. This is. Yes. Has have to have uh, is di is equal to zero here? Sorry, what is di? No, yeah. I'm absorbing an absorbing xi into f0 by a quadratic term. I see, okay. Uh, and this defines f0, this defines f0 uh, after uh, this defines if you want a new f0 which includes a quadratic term of xi. You, you know, f0 is only defined really up to linear and, quadra and quadratic terms in xi. So I can just absorb this part here in xi. In, in F0, okay? And By redefining F0. This is a technical point. Yeah. And the CI DI looks like it determines a three cycle here. What's special about the three cycle? Now, this, uh, as I said, A, the action, the location of real singularities are integral periods, okay? okay? So this is the most general integral period where CI and DI are integer numbers. So if I our see. conjecture about the location of real singularities is true, this would be any action is going to be an integral period of this type. I see. Okay. Uh, as I said, this is a conjecture. We we can check it in examples. Um, and I I think there is a kind of deep reason for this. But uh, I mean, in, in some in some in some in some limits, you can actually justify this kind of more deeply. In the case of compact Calabiaus, it's not so obvious. So so let me actually give you now. Um, some experimental evidence for this formula. Because remember one thing that I emphasized before is that if you know a one instant on amplitude, you should be able to deduce the asymptotics of the, of the perturbative series from it. So I'm telling you here that this formula should actually determine the asymptotics of the FGs. So let me give you an example uh, with the famous Quinti Calabilla. Now, let me take the Quinti Calabilla. So there is a special point in moduli space, which is the large reduced point. So I'm going to parameterize this as z equals zero. So this z is the standard set that people use for the quintic. There is a conifold point at five to the minus five. And I'm going to just pick one value, one value of the moduli, which is just the intermediate point between large radius and the conifold point. And at this point, you can actually see that the action, the Borel singularity, which is closer to the origin, is actually F0, which is the vanishing period at the cone. Okay, this is just an, uh, an experimental fact that you can find. Remember that I'm not telling you where are the Borel singularities. The Borel singularities, you have to find your way, you have to have a, a way of, of finding them. Once you know where is the Borel singularity, I can actually compute the one instant on action. Okay, now empirically, you find that the Borel singularity, which controls the asymptotics, is this vanishing period at the conical. And then you actually can compute the asymptotics according to this formula. And this is a kind of test of this. So in these red dots, we're doing here a calculation of the FGs. We're taking, we're calculating the FG up to relatively high genus. I think here is genus 38. 
So we take this sequence, which is a sequence in which, in a sense, we have removed the factorial divergence and the exponential growth. Uh, so this is this sequence here. And then, you know, when you want to see the asymptotics, sequences mm, are not really very useful unless you do some acceleration of the convergence to actually see the limit, because, you know, 38 points is not really very good to see large genus asymptotics. So we do a Richardson acceleration of this sequence, and then we find that the points really fall on this line. And this line is the prediction of the one instanton formula for this asymptotics. So you see, it just fits right on the spot. Okay, so this, this is really kind of very precise numerical test here, and, and you are not seeing the digits here, but this is precision of, of, of 10 digits for this, uh, for this match. So this is really an experimental evidence that this one instant on correction that we have computed is actually the actual one instant on correction for the quintical area. So this, this formula should be regarded, this formula should be regarded as computing one instant on corrections in arbitrary compact calabillas, okay? And this is the test with the asymptote. Okay, so, so time is running out. So let me make some comment on those constants because this is also something that I didn't tell you uh, about. Remember that I told you that if you have a natural normalization of your trans series, the Stokes constants are also determined. So here I give you some natural normalization of the phi i's by writing this formula. And now you should ask, what are, what are these Stokes constants? Now, there are some interesting examples that have been observed in which uh, the Stokes constant turned out to be integers related to BPS invariants. Uh, and this was uh, pointed out, for example, in the context of WKB in, 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 in the kind of uh, very well-known work by Gayoto, Mur, and Nitzke. And it turns out to be more general than that. And we were relatively surprised to see that in complex chain simons theory, when you look at perturbative series in complex chain simons theory and you do this type of analysis, the Stokes constants turn out to be also integers. Okay? Now, now, the question you can ask is, what are the Stokes constants associated to these Borel singularities in topological string theory? And, and here we expect a similar picture. We expect that the Stokes constants with appropriate normalizations are going to be integer BPS invariants of this Calabria. And we don't have a complete picture, but we can show, for example, that the genus zero Gopakumar buffer invariants arise as a Stokes constants associated to a particular sequence of Borel singularities. So it turns out that if you are near the maximal, the maximal unimodromy point of the Calabi Yau, there are going to be Borel singularities at the positions d times x1 plus n times x0, where x1 and x0 are, 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 are the, the periods determining the, the mirror map. M is an arbitrary integer, and then all these all these singularities have the same Stokes constant. It turns out to be the Gopa, the Gopakumar Bafa genus zero invariant. This is actually quite surprising, and it's actually an easy an easy um, uh, an easy consequence of the multi covering and multi wrapping formula of Gopakumar, of Gopakumar and Bafa. And you can also check it with the asymptotic. So so we know that some integer invariants of the Calabria really arise as the Stokes constants, and the question is. Are these Stokes constants associated to general Borel singularities be giving you some new window into, say, for example, Donaldson-Thomas invariance? This is a very interesting question that uh, we don't have a complete answer to. Okay, so let me mention, uh, I'm already finishing, so this is maybe my, my last uh, transparency before the conclusions. So let me mention the relation to other work. So many recent works have explored the relation between supersymmetric gauge theories, topological strings, Riemann-Hilbert problems, and BPS countings. Here I made a list of uh, probably incomplete list of people who have worked on this. But may, let, let me make a comment for the experts. Now, many of these works assume that the Stokes automorphisms that appear in this, in this story are of the conservative Soilman type, or what I would call the De La Baer fan type. Okay? Now, in our approach, we don't assume anything about the form of Stokes automorphisms. This is actually the theory should tell us what is the form of Stokes automorphisms. Uh, and, and this is, in a sense, the difference between resurgence and, and, and the sort of like more traditional world crossing approach. In resurgence, you don't impose Stokes automorphisms for Stokes automorphisms are very general, and you have to find which is the form of, of, of them. And actually, from our formula for multi instantons, it follows that Stokes automorphisms in topological string theory associated to this perturbative series of topological string theory 
do not seem to have this de la Baer fan form. So it's a more general form. The de la Baer fan form means essentially that multi instantons are going to be essentially powers of the one instanton uh, correction divided by n. And so the n instanton correction is the one instanton correction to the n divided by n. And this is not the case in general, and in particular for the topological string. So this is, I think, something that is actually something that should be clarified further. OK, so let me let me uh, and reach already my conclusion. So let me give you my conclusions. So I, I have tried to motivate how the theory of resurgence gives a relatively simple and relatively um, precise mathematical framework to understand non perturbative sectors. So this is really very general. You can apply it to many theories. People have applied this to quantum mechanics, have applied this to quantum field theory, and you can also apply it to topological string theory. So, so in order to do that, what we have done is in a sense to develop instanton calculus for the Coedera Spencer theory of VCOV. And when you do that, it's surprising that you can actually find exact solutions for instanton amplitudes, and they actually are predictive. These formulas are, are non-trivial, and, and they predict, for example, large genus asymptotics. You can, in a sense, the best way to get precise formula for asymptotics is to use resurgence theory, and this is no exception. Now, since these formula are derived for the general holomorphic anomaly equations, they apply to any system which satisfies the holomorphic anomaly equations, and this involves, this includes in particular large chain matrix models. Large chain matrix models, the genus expansion of large chain matrix models is controlled also for the, by the holomorphic anomaly equation. So this formula for instantons that I wrote here are also valid for calculating generic instantons in multi cad matrix models. Now, there are many things that have to be understood better. Uh, you see, the, the understanding of the full resolving structures requires knowing for any given value of the moduli like where are exactly the Borel singularities and what are the Stokes constants. And I expect a very rich mathematics and physics uh, structure related to BPS invariance and Riemann Hilbert problems if you are able to solve this problem. Now, another thing which I, I find very, very interesting here and very intriguing is the meaning of these instanton amplitudes. Now, they really look like deep brains because they are, they are given, the actions are actual, uh, uh, are actual periods of the Calabi-Yau, but they are in a sense of the wrong type. You know, people have been saying that you have a, a type 2 uh, topological string, the exponential corrections are going to involve Lagrangians of manifolds. And here we see that these exponential corrections involve in a sense, um, uh, even dimensional cycles, not uh, Lagrangians of manifolds, because they are given by the periods of the Calabi-Yau. So, so maybe these are not instantons. Maybe these are sort of, of renormalons of the topological string. And I think this is actually quite interesting because remember that renormalons are due to integration over the moduli space. And, and in a sense, these, 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 these amplitudes that we are computing here tell you how the integration over the moduli space of, 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 of Riemann surface uh, diverges factorial. So maybe these are not really instantons, they are renormalons, and you have to add yet another sector associated to Lagrangian of manifolds to have a complete description of the theory. And finally, it would be also interesting to understand how, so this is in line with the question of Greg, how this formal construction of trans series actually gives you or helps you to give non perturbative definitions of the topological string and how this compares to non perturbative definitions which have been already given in the literature. So this is all I wanted to say. I thank you very much for your attention. So let's thank the speaker. And we have time uh, for a few more questions. Oops. So maybe I'll start us off. So you had uh, you wrote this uh, um, completely canonical solution for kind of the one, on, one for the holomorphic anomaly equation, kind of the one instanton piece in some sense. Um, yes. And usually, I hear people say that um, the solution to the holomorphic anomaly equation is not totally unique, but it's up to some ambiguity which has to be fixed in some other yes, way. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. Here in uh, do you see my screen? Do you see yes, yes. Yeah, yes. So in, in, in writing this, you have to do some sort of non-perturbative fixing of the holomorphic ambiguity. And and this is done by looking in, in a sense, it's the same thing. You have to look at the behavior of the theory near the conic point. 
Remember that the behavior near the conifer point determines, gives you a lot of information about the holomorphic ambiguity. And here is also the case. This was actually already discussed in the paper by, by CA, CESV, COSO, and company. They already found that the behavior at the conifer actually is very important to fix the holomorphic ambiguity. So there is some fixing of the holomorphic ambiguity. Um, and notice also that um, here and assume that I, already, I, I assume in order to write this formula, I assume that I was able to fix the holomorphic ambiguity in the perturbative sector, okay? In a sense, and studying the linearized version of the holomorphic anomaly equation. So and assuming that I have a full solution for the perturbative sector, including the holomorphic ambiguity. And then once I know this, I have to fix a new holomorphic ambiguity in the non-perturbative sector by looking again at what happens near the conifer, And this is what gives you this formula. What is surprising is that in a sense, it's simpler to fix the holomorphic ambiguity for the, for the instantons than to fix it in perturbation theory. But as you say, you use the fact that you already fixed it in perturbation theory. Yes, yes, that's, that's the thing. We are linearizing. So we are assuming right. that I know the exact solution in the perturbative sector already with the holomorphic ambiguity fixed. Yeah, absolutely. Got it, thank you. I have one other question too. So you said a lot about uh, uh, the the closed topological string, like on local P2, for example. Is Did you try at all to do anything similar for the open topological string in local P2? Yeah, we are working on it um, now. Uh, there are two types of open topological strings. There is one which involves moduli, so it's like looking at wave functions in WKB. So in a sense, looking at the closed topological string is like looking at, 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 at energies in WKB and looking at the open topological string is looking at wave functions in WKB. Now this is more complicated because you have all the open moduli. But there is a kind of relatively simpler version of, of open topological string, which is the real topological string of Walther, which also appears in the compact case. And this only depends on closed moduli. So, so this is something that we're trying to, to figure out because you know, I think in order to understand better the meaning of these instantons, you know, looking at the open case might be might be might be actually clarifying. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? This is a sort of a naive question, um, but the as far as the meaning of the instantons. Um, and, and being wrong type brains. Um, do, you, do you see any signal of them in like Kadira Spencer theory um, or any any other space-time formulation of, or approximation to topological s strings or, or do they always s sort of look wrong? Um, well, you know, Godard Spencer theory is a very tricky theory because I don't know in which sense is really, I mean, I don't know in which sense is really a fundamental theory, right? Now, in principle, it would be great if you could do some sort of, I mean, Godard Spencer theory is, is the closer thing we have to a string field theory of, of the topological string, right? So in principle, you should be able to find classical solutions of the string field theory action. And, yeah. this, and this would describe, um, you know, some non perturbative sectors, at least of the instant on type. Uh, this is something that is easier said than done. Okay. And if you just keep trying to do this, you know, it's, I think it's going to be very hard to make progress. That's why we follow this route, which is like more formal, which is based on linearization of the holomorphic anomaly equations. And there we can at least write these solutions. But yeah, I, I don't know how I would interpret this. Uh, first, I thought that these really are instant on solutions. Now I'm not completely sure. Uh, there might be maybe additional instanton solutions, instanton corrections actually coming from actual Lagrangian three brains. Uh, and then these might be different type of phenomena, non perturbative phenomena, topological string. One thing that I realized recently is that, you see, in, in, in quantum field theory, you usually distinguish two types of non perturbative effects the ones due to instantons and the ones due to renormalons. And usually you say that instantons are due to the growth of Feynman diagrams. And renormalons are due to integration over momentum. Now, if this, if you apply this to string theory, then you know in string theory you only have one Feynman diagram. 
So in a sense, this looks like instant on corrections are going to be trivial, and everything comes from the divergence of the integrals of the moduli space. But this is more like a renormalon type of divergence. So maybe these are not really instant on, these are renormalons, and then they do not maybe have an easy semi-classical description in terms of string field theory. All this is very speculative, but I think at least you know we can now that we have answers, we can try to think about them. Thanks for expanding a bit on that. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again. There is another question. Oh, oh there is. So, um, so, um, so Marcos, I think you said this really quickly at the end, but I just want to confirm. So um, I was curious to know whether your your uh, work here, your exact solution for this trans series has any implications for asymptotics of um, Donaldson-Thomas invariance. So if I fix a I six fix a two cycle beta in the second homology lattice, the D2 number and an integer n D0 number, and consider the Donaldson Thomas invariant of beta and n. Mm -hmm. Now I like to know the asymptotics where I take some scaling factor lambda mm -hmm. and I scale beta by mm -hmm. lambda squared and n by lambda cubed and take lambda to infinity. So you are doing some sort of a scaling both in the genus and the degree, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. the behavior is a function of lambda. The asymptotic behavior of this as a function of lambda um, is an important quantity for deciding if the OSV conjecture has any Yes, error. yes, I remember about that, yeah, yeah. So I was yeah. just wondering, so I'm, I'm yeah. always wondering about that question. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We are only now. Hmm, yeah, we are only now starting to look at the asymptotic issues. So the asymptotics is quite tricky. Um, right now, um, it's not obvious that we can actually make contact with that uh, type of uh, scaling behavior that you were describing, because you see, uh, you have to in resurgence in order to get asymptotic from resurgence, you have to tell me exactly what is the series that you are starting with. And then we have to do a uh, resurgent study of that series. So in principle, what you can get here, what you have is Fg of t. So it's the asymptotics of Fg at t fix with large genus, okay? Yeah, you have to convert that to a Donaldson-Thomas invariance. Yeah, then it's, 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 it's non-trivial. Now, if for example, you're, yeah. So, so the only non-trivial result I have in that sense is for all before Gromov of Witten invariance at fixed degree. So this has a very complicated asymptotics, which I, seems that this is the only way you can actually track it. But I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I, I should think about it. I mean, if, if, if you can actually get some handle on this on this growth coming from this type of studies. But okay. right now, I don't have an answer to that. Thanks. Are there any more questions? All right. If not, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Thanks. Thank you. Good Bye. You. Okay, Andy. So I guess I will see you in mind at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um,